Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have our final speaker of the morning session, Andras Teves, speaking with us about offensive rust tails. Not too offensive, we hope. No, definitely not. <laughs> okay, so I am happy to be here, and after the past two years behind webcams, this is great. Um, okay, who else did participate in red teaming in the past years in the room? Okay, at least one guy. <laughs> That's something. Okay. Would you like to execute my binary? Okay, <laughs> that's good. So, uh, how many guys are you using corporate laptops? Okay, some of you. Most of you use Windows, I assume. And do you use Office, like o Open Office or Microsoft Office? If Microsoft Office, then this will be an interesting presentation. Okay, about me. I am Andras Teves. Currently working as a senior IT security researcher at Kujo AI. I have more than 15 years IT security experience on different fields. Like I was a developer, researcher, penetration tester, and I think many more things. You may run my code in production. Uh, if you use syslog ng, for example, then that might be some of my codes. Okay, I have done security research in the past 10 years, more than that, but it's rather hard to present on a conference if you are not called a security researcher. So when I was working at a bigger company like Morgan Stanley and I am going to my PR team that, okay, I hack this and I would like to present about it, then they say, no, please, no, please don't. So I changed and now I am trying to present something. The presentation will be mostly about Red Teaming 101 because we have only one guy who participated, that's great. It might be helpful for you guys. I will provide some details about when should you do uh, Red Teaming, when should you execute it, what is it called, who should it look like, who should do that, and of course, why should you do that. Okay. <laughs> So a red team is a group of professional people, hopefully professional, and this is the key, authorized to do something. Like emulated attack, achieve something, gain access to your systems. And is, it, is it familiar for you? So did you do something similar, like maybe pen tests? Yeah, it's, it's similar. If, if you go to a pen tester company and ask them to do something, they will focus on an application or a website, or, or some mostly simple thing, and they will have a limited time because mm, you won't pay much enough for them. So in most cases, it will be 10 days or something, and one or two guys will be there or will help you. So time is limited, and the penetration test in the most cases is rather noisy. So if you have a team who can detect, they will detect it if they are not sleeping. Red team, on the other hand, is a bit different because in that case, you have those guys. So red team is, is more complex because in that case, you are not really focusing on generating as many vulnerabilities as possible in a network. Rather, you are focusing on how to do it end to end and what will happen from the other side. So if you have a blue team, most of, most of us don't have a blue team, but if we would have one, then that blue team should detect an attack. And if the red team is good enough, they can fight. And that could be interesting. So red team is more time, it takes more time, it takes more resources, and as well it takes more money. But it should be more silent than a simple penetration testing. Maybe you have heard something about ransomware gangs. Is it similar or is it, yes. It's rather similar, but in that case, you pay much more and you lose some data as well, so not that safe. So, why are we doing this? I am doing this because it's fun and it's interesting and challenging. From a customer viewpoint or from the business viewpoint, it's a relative safe option because 
you know who is coming, you can define a target. You can tell them, this is the service that you should reach. This is our Amazon production service. If you can reach that, then we are, we are happy and, and please document what you did. Okay, next step is the who. If you are a big company, then you should have a red team. So it's an internal one. You maintain that team, you pay them lots of money, and then they play with your network. And if they are good, then they will kill the network, and everybody will be happy. In Hungary, the more realistic way is to pay for someone and search for a professional company who can do that for you. I am not sure if there is one in Hungary, but we will see. And the uh, other question is, when should you do that? If your organization is prepared and if your organization is at least partially confident that they can catch an intruder, and by catching an intruder, I don't mean that grabbing his hand at the gate and then taking away to a back room, rather catching them on the network. And if they are doing something like executing an unsigned application on your corporate laptop and then gaining other accesses, and you can catch that, then you are there. You should, you should uh, start a red team exercise. So, VVV. I found this for my presentation when I was looking up for documents. This is a great representation how all the teams should cooperate in a network, or not in a network, really in a, a company. This is valid for a huge company like Fortune 500, Fortune 1000. If your company is, let's say, 100 people, then you definitely won't need this or all of this, but you would need some. Uh, yellow team. You know yellow team, most of, you, most of you are developers. So if you are a developer, you are part of the yellow team. There are green teams, DevOps, Sec DevOps, something like that. Yellow, oh, that was okay. So orange team is basically training. If you are uh, learning something about phishing, if you are learning something new, then that should be done by the yellow team, or orange team. And I will talk about red teaming and I am. Blue team is the opposite of the red team. They are trying to defend the network. If they catch you, then you might get fired. If you have a paper that you can do that, you might not get fired. You might get a promotion. And the purple team is when you are mature enough and all your red teaming is willing to do blue team stuff and the other, then they are merged into a purple team. Okay, let's see a, at a typical attack scenario how this should work. Normally we start with information gathering. If you have an internal team, this is rather easy. You sit down and go and ask the users. If it's an external company, then they should go and look up data in the OSINT way. So go to Shodan, DNS dumpster, execute port scans, go to LinkedIn. Maybe you could go and try to get a job at the company just saying, if you call HR, HR will provide you lots of information, like what systems are we using, what uh, competencies are we lack of, because we would like to hire someone, so we should not have that, right? Okay. The next step is to decide how to evade and how to get into the system. Most cases, most companies are using emails or Slack. But email is more common because it's more integrated with the external world. So you might get an email. In the past time, you might get a phishing email, protection, training, like what you should not do, like click on a link and don't download it. If you download it, don't execute it. If you execute it, then don't. <laughs> Later I will show why. So infiltration gets somehow into the network. Physical access in, in the modern world, like west from here, you can, you can do physical access uh, red teaming, like get into an office and use your lockpicks and pick the office door and get into the office and see how can you get access to a server room. Normally we have a server room that's well protected, but there might be a back door and that's the red teaming for. Okay, let's assume that Somehow you did send in an email or you did, you did uh, send in a link 
and you have at least one user who was somehow asked to execute that binary. We call the stager. The next part of the presentation will be more about stagers and how they should work. Okay. Corporate laptop, yes. I don't want to do that. So <laughs> gain initial access, execute something. It can be a file, it can be a binary, it can be anything. In a Microsoft environment, you can execute help files, and those help files can execute other binaries. Or you can execute, you can open an Excel file, and those Excel files could execute binaries like commands or PowerShell. You know, Excel is great in PowerShell. And if somehow you executed your binary, then that's the last stage, when you are going for the target. Just an example, if you have a production system, production system is running on AWS, then the red team should get access to the AWS systems, like use VPN, but VPN is well protected, is it not? Like security tokens, passwords, and, and sessions, and, and all the other stuff. Okay, let's move forward. So, as I mentioned, we did send in an email. The victim is somewhat known. We did our homework, we did collect his, I don't know, laptop. We know that he's running Windows. We know that what components are running on his laptop. Like, we know at least the antivirus. Maybe we know the version. Maybe we might know the firewalls, if there is any. He downloaded the binary or stager, and then here we must bypass some protections. Like if you download something from the internet, the browser is telling you that don't do that, don't execute it, no, 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 but you are executing it because you would like to do something. You would like to update a system. So if I, for example, call you by phone and tell you that I am from I don't know, an antivirus company, and I will push you an update. And this update is rather important, because if you don't execute it, then your sheep will die, or I don't know, or your apes will be lost. That's, that's better. You, you will lose your apes. So you execute it. The execution will download something from the internet. That's the red team. In my case, in this uh, later demo, uh, I downloaded Pupi, and I will dub it later Pupi because it's, it resonates better how we should use that application. So it's Pupi and Pupi. And also, we have a component called Hidden VNC. But my. Sorry. Whatever. <laughs> so that's Hayden VNC behind that connect to me. Hayden VNC will be interesting at the later stage. And Hayden VNC is rather similar to VNC. You can get access to a computer and you can uh, run applications on that computer. The good thing is that you can see the output of that application, but the user can't see. So you can copy things and execute browsers. You will see the browser window, but the user won't see it. You will have the same session. And with that access, you, you can access anything in the browser, like cookies, tokens, SSO. If you have passwords safe in your browser, maybe, maybe, then that's also there, and it's also accessible. So that will be the demo later. Let's get back to information gathering. Here I, I would like to provide some details uh, during my investigation how to how to discover valid users in a system. I did run into this. I tried to report this, but nobody really was interested. And after um, I think two day, two or three days ago, I discovered that this is well known. So it was just new for me, but um, it's interesting. So information gathering. Do you know Microsoft? Yes, yes, we know. And do you know Azure? Most of you are using, I assume, Azure ADs. 
maybe, maybe Microsoft Office from the browser. How are you authenticating to that? Yes, it's OAuth 2. And OAuth 2 is great because it's integrated. All the user likes it. They can get in without providing new passwords. So it's a great thing. This is a window. If you are trying to log into Office, you will see the, mm, this window. And it depends on what data you put in. If you use your private e email address, it will show you something. If you use your corporate email address, it will show you a totally different thing. And there is an authentication backend for this. And the authentication backend decides based on many things. Like you provide an email address, it has a domain part, and it has a username part. And it will provide you details about that specific user. So if you send something to these endpoints, then you can figure out what the email is. Is it a valid email address? You might get login with that. Is it logged out? Is it throttled? We will see it later. So you set an email address. You get that window. And you might get a simple login window if you are Kim at G something something. You might get this window if you are Kim at D something something something. Hopefully, nobody knows this window. OK? Try to remove as many features as possible. And there, there are interesting uh, places when you provide one email address, you might have different authentications for that. So you can authenticate directly, and you can authenticate with a federated authentication. This is rather strange. I did not know about that. OK. Let's see what's behind. So there is an API called get credential type. If you type in your email address, you will see those. Like, we will know that you have a certificate authentication param. Can you authenticate with Facebook? Can you authenticate with Fido? Google? Is there a password at all? And we can, oh, shit, Microsoft did remain in. OK, so if you go down, you see much more stuff, like what branding information is there? What uh, logos are the company using in an email? So imagine a case that you would like to send an email, a phishing email, and you don't have the logo for the company. Here it is. Microsoft stores it for you. You can download it from the cloud. And then you can use it. I think this is great for phishing. And I would like to highlight this here. It's the most important part. If that's zero, then we are OK. If that's other values, then we are more OK. OK, let's see. Some great animations. So we have two things. We have federated authentication and non-federated authentication. Federated, in this case, means that someone else is doing the real work, and Microsoft is just interfacing with them. And then Microsoft creates a, a token, and you can use that token, the OAuth token. Click, click, click. OK. So depending on your domain, you will get a federated URL, and the federated URL will do the authentication. This is not really important for us, because we need to go to the federated endpoint and figure out some data about the users. But if you are not federated, then there is the is exist result value. And let's assume that we have a random string in our email address that uh, is exist result value will be one. If we have a valid email address, then the value will be zero. So what happens if you would like to figure out an email to attack or to figure out an email, a victim's email? Yes, you try three, four times, and then you will get an email. And there is no authentication happening here. So you can basically ask 1,000 times, million times. Maybe at the million, you might get a throttle, but that's it. There are also other values here. There is one for throttling. So if your authentication is throttled, then that value will be 2. If there are some errors, then it could be minus 1, 4. And 5 and 6 is for federated authentication or it might be federated authentication. 
is this similar? So did we hear something like this in the past? Like a web application, and if you go to a web application, provide your email and type in a random password, and then what happens? The application tells you that, OK, your password is wrong, but the email seems to be OK. So maybe try some new passwords, because you, you might figure it out, or the other way, like. Normally, we should tell the user here that go away, something is broken, we don't know what. Or your authentication session did not happen, try again. But definitely not telling anybody that it is, it's a valid user in the specific domain. So, infiltrating infrastructures. Infiltrating, this might be interesting. So, as I mentioned, we sent in an email, and in my case, it was a simple email, and the victim downloaded the binary, and he executed it, because he was instructed to do so by his boss, by someone. What happens in a system if, if you execute? Or first, let's start from downloading. If you get an email, and there is a link in that email, you would like to download something. So, Go there, click on the link, and Chrome and Edge will tell you that it's an exe. Don't do that, don't execute it. But you will because you are people. If you have a huge binary, like more than 65 megabytes, I think, then the browser will simply ignore it. If it's an, if it's an exe, who cares? It's a big exe, so we don't scan it. Let's go through. OK, next step. Markov Web. Have you ever heard about Markov Web? Okay, some, some. If you download something from the internet, most of the browsers will use alternate data streams to store info about that data. So it will be marked as it's an external data, it's from the internet, mostly it's from the internet. So it's not safe. Please don't execute it. Smart screen might yell at you that don't execute it, but you will execute it. Those Markov maps are interesting because if you download a zip file and you happen to use 7-zip, then 7-zip is not really using Markov web. So if you unzip something from a zip file, 7-zip will simply drop the Markov web and you will be safe because you did unzip it. The other option is that you simply use an ISO file, you download the ISO file, it's a huge ISO file, so we don't mark it. And the ISO file itself is marked by the Markov web, but if you click on it, Windows will happily open it and mount it. You will have a, a virtual CD-ROM and no Markov web in the virtual CD-ROMs, so you can execute binaries without any yelling. In my case, the small disk footprint is 1.2 megabytes, so it, it depends. If it would be a virus, then it should be much, much, much smaller, but this is a small footprint. My application is doing uh, some data gathering, like figuring out what user is running it, which domain is it running in. So if we are in the proper domain and executed by the proper user, then we are happy and we will download components based on those. If you are somewhere else, like you are executed in a sandbox, those sandboxes won't have the proper domains, so application won't execute. This helps us target a specific attack, and it will also make the life of the um, protection, so the blue team, much harder, because normally they won't have any details about the attack. They will have a binary that's downloading something from somewhere, but if they don't know specifically the username and the domain, then it won't be downloaded by them. So everybody is happy, except the blue team. Sandbox evasion. Please raise your hand if you have seen a sandbox with more than eight gigabytes of RAM. OK. OK. Have you ever seen a sandbox with four CPU cores? OK. Might be. Can we detect these values? Like, is there an API to query it? Yes, sadly, but there is. So those two values can bypass mostly all of the sandboxes. And that's it. As I mentioned, uh, I will have plugins. I will talk about it later. 
plugin in this case is a simple exa binary. I could encrypt it, but basically I used HTTPS, so don't have to encrypt it again. But we could specifically target it for the user, and based on the username and domain, we could encrypt it as well. So if someone downloads it, there is, a, there is no key, really, because the key is based on the environment. The key is not in the binary. So if someone is looking at the binary, they won't have that key. One of my plugins is the VNC implementation. Oh. I should definitely switch off the Wi-Fi. So the Hidden VNC is great for accessing browsers and other applications. We'll talk about it later. And as I mentioned, we have multi-factor authentication. You know, if, if you use multi-factor authentication like two or three or four steps and biometrics and, and other stuff, what will be the end of an authentication? What will you have? Some ideas like hash or cookies? You will have a cookie, right? Do you store those cookies in the browser? Yes, OK. So what happens if, if we copy the, the browser's profile and then re-execute it in another process? We might have that data. Yes. OK. So this was a short introduction so far. And let's talk a bit about Rust. Rust is a great programming language. It's From the reversing viewpoint, it's, it's rather hard to understand. It's doing stuff rather differently. Its main advantage is that the code is ugly, and the binary is ugly as well. So if you, if you try to reverse some, some other programs, this might get interesting. It has a static binary. So if you compile something, it will be a bit, a bit bigger than a normal Windows application, but your malware won't ask for the ELS because it's, it's not that good if you, if you send the application to your uh, victim and he executes it, or she, or they, and then the application asks for a DLL because please download me MSV, CRT, whatever, to, to be executed. You might get passed through that, but that's a bit harder. So static binary is great for attacks. Rust has a steep learning curve. Steep in this case means that you will, you will beg for mercy after two weeks. And after two more weeks, you might get through, through that phase. Rust has also a great async code. So you can create really easy async code implementation. If you are a JavaScript programmer, you know what I am talking about. You execute it, you forget it, and then you might use the data or not. From a dynamic analysis perspective, this is also great because I execute a lot of stuff, and if someone is trying to analyze my binary, he will go through and, and find out all the different random parts of the application, and they are not really doing anything. To be honest, for me, it was strange to see that Rust is well integrated into Windows, so you can create great Windows applications. And these are the rather helpful error messages. So if you are trying to work with Rust, you will run into Barrow Checker. Barrow Checker is, is something that's trying to protect your code from yourself. That's my view on it. And also, it's, it's rather painful so, to satisfy. But if you learn how to do that, then you will be a great Rust programmer, and hopefully you will be better in other programming languages as well. So helpful message, lifetime mismatch. OK, great. Unnecessary unsafe block. Don't do unsafe stuff. No, it's, it's bad for you. And, and others. My favorite was the X does not, long live, uh, does not live long enough for you. <laughs> but I did not kill it. What happened? OK. So let's talk a bit about how my application works and how my loader works. You know, loader is, is rather simple. You download something, execute it, it pokes around, collects some information, it hashes that information, and then based on those hashes, it will go and try to find other components. So normally, 
the loader, loader section is totally harmless. It does not do anything if you don't count that it downloads malwares and executes them, but that's not really bad for me. And we have other components. We have the hidden VNC implementation, uh, not so harmless. It, it could be used for many stuff. I will talk about it later in more details. And we have also Pupi. Pupi is harmless. We love Pupi, so it's great. You can execute applications. You can execute any Python code because Pupi has an integrated Python environment in it. So some Rust code. Every good technical presentation should contain at least some source code. Is it visible? Is it readable? OK. I choose those mainly for readability and to, to, to provide some visibility how Rust look like. In this case, I used Visual Studio code. And Visual Studio provides some, some hints, some type hints. In most cases, that's uh, static. But in some, in some cases, it might be misleading. The misleading section is where you are trying to figure out why the hell is it not compiling or not working. But normally, it, it's OK. For a string, it works. So these, these are the three functions that I talked about. Mem exec, exec, obviously, it downloads a binary from somewhere. It gets the binary data in a reference. Then it creates a thread and executes it. That's great for our purposes. We download something and don't write it onto the disk. So no bad code will ever touch the disk. It will only be in the memory. Check, as I mentioned, is validating the values about CPU and, and memory. No. Yeah. And host names. And if we have enough memory, so we are not running in a virtual machine, a small virtual machine, or not running in a sandbox, then we go through. If we, if we don't pass, there is the panic exit. Panic, in this case, will create a screenshot about your desktop, and it will upload it to my server. So I will see who is trying to mess with my application if it's not the target. Hash, uh, in this case, hash function is used to identify the domain and the user. And then, based on those hash values, I can target the user. So if I know that he is using a router or laptop, I can create specific implants for him that can be executed in his old laptop. So this is what happens if you are the target. We will collect information, and we will upload the JSON file to our servers. And this happens if you are not the target, or if you are like a malware analyst. So if a malware analyst executes the binary, then we will have his desktop. It's not really useful, but it's fun. OK, a bit talk about Pupi. This is an interesting application. It implemented a huge amount of of services. Originally, I wanted to create a cryptor, a loader, and, and much more stuff. But after some, some time, I figured it out that I don't really have two years for this. So I started to look for smaller components that are usable in my case. And Pupi is great in this because it has Python. It runs on Android. You can execute it on Windows. It runs on Linux. And because this is Python, it's rather easy to create an installer. It handles, multi, um, it handles scripts. You can generate DLS. Just name it. In most cases, Puppy will do that. The only issue is that Puppy is based on Python 2.7. So if you are trying to compile it, then you might have to patch it at least 10 times and 10 different places. And that might help you to build a Docker image. The Docker image might work, but it's, in most cases, it's not working. But you can figure it out. Maybe later I will push the changes to the Pupi main repository. So this is the nice UI. I think it's unreadable from the backlines, but I try to do the best. So if you ever used Metalpreter or other similar tools, then this will be rather similar to you. I have four more minutes, and I am late. 
Okay, let's speed this up. This was about Pupi modules and what Pupi implemented. It has Air Desktop. It can enable your Air Desktop. It can execute your binaries, SSH, and it can also support persistency. So they created multiple modules to help you with persistency. And based on your level of access, it can automatically do that for you. You can copy files. So in my case, I did simply download my binary and then use Puppy to enable persistency. And my binary is not harm harmful, so we can execute it automatically. OK, let's speed it up again. What the user sees. So normally, this is what the user sees. And what happens if you use IDEM VNC? We see those. There are some minor differences. If you execute a window here at the user side, it won't be visible there. And the same stance, if you execute it on the hidden VNC, it will not be visible by the user. This is mainly used by financial mirrors because your money is in your bank, your bank provides you a web application, and web application is protected by some authentication. And if you are through that authentication, this approach is great to defeat most of the bank, bank site protections. And there is a tiny hint for browser developers. If your application runs in a standard Windows environment, you can query the desktop name. It will be default. But if it's something else, then maybe you are not running where you should be. So you might be running in a hidden virtual desktop or any any other places that you don't really want to start your browser. OK, some more technical stuff. All this is based on the original Windows implementation. Mm, who is old enough can remember Windows APIs. The old Windows APIs, those were introduced in Windows 3.1 in 1992. And I think Microsoft did mention at least four times that we did rewrite everything from sketch, everything. And the everything is not really true because the core Windows API is there. So since Windows, I think maybe Windows may, maybe 1.0, but definitely from Windows 3.1, there is this API. You have a VND pros. VND pros will handle all the messages for you. VND pros was introduced in, in the original Windows 3.1. And it tried to implement something like a multi-threading, but it was called cooperative multitasking because you should cooperate with other applications. So if your VND process is running at full scale and it does something like, I don't know, downloads a binary, then you basically killed all the other Windows applications. So it's not, good, not that great. Later, they created more stuff. This is a plain old VND prods, how it's implemented. It gets a message. The message is something like, in this case, VM paint. So you should be repainted. Application will repaint its button, list, drop down list, something. And then it must go forward and use the def window pros. On the left side, if you see it, there is a set window hook AX. This is a great function because you can execute it and you can. In directly inject your DLL into any Windows applications. Is it, is it good or is it useful? Yes, from my view, it's, it's a great application. I really, in the past, have never even seen application using it for good purposes. But this is there since, I don't know, Windows 95. That was an application, but it doesn't really add anything for us. So how to create a IDEM VNC? First, call Create Desktop. Then write your own window handler. And then implement your VNC. So it's rather fast. Create Desktop. Create Desktop is there since Windows 2000. And you can call it. And in most cases, it will work. It's rather easy to use. The handling of the windows and the other stuff is a bit different part. So the implementation is server client-based. Your application is connected 
to the server. In this case, the victim is running the client and the attacker is running the server. As I mentioned, we have messages in Windows and those messages can be sent from one window to the other. And in this case, we implemented a TCP-based VND process. So if I click on the server application on the window, then the message will be sent over TCP to the client and the client will do that. We have to do some mapping on, on mouse coordinates and, and stuff like that, but it, it works. Some more unreadable code. Open desktop is the right side, and the left side is how to create your desktop. So Windows provides APIs. Windows provides APIs to iterate all over the windows, and you can figure out which desktop you would like to iterate over, and then you can use to render the window. There are APIs for that, and then you can copy out it, and you can basically render your own Windows implementation. It's less interesting than it is. The server part is totally unreadable, but this is also rather simple. We have a VND process on the server that will handle the messages that you generated by clicking or moving your mouse or painting it. And the right side is how you create a Windows desktop uh, application, so how to pop up a window. If it's similar to you, then I am sad to say that you are old. Okay, why is it this good for us? I am not sure what this application is, but we might execute it, and, and if we can log keystrokes, then if you, see th if you read that string, this application might not get uh, second factor authentications for a month. So if you have the password, then you can access all the fine data in this something vault. Okay, so left side is the target, in this case the victim, right side is the attacker. If he executed the application, normally the user is seeing this. So he started his browser and wisely he saved his own password there in the Firefox password store. What happens if we execute the application in, the, in our desktop? Well, we will see the same. So Firefox will provide us all the necessary passwords. What happens if we log in to, to MS Office? Can you guess? Yes. We can access anything in a mesh office with the original user's privileges, like basically anything. And because we are talking about cloud, anything. And this would be the demo. If I can figure out how to provide sound. So there will be three different parts. The left side is the victim, the right side is the attacker, and underneath will be pupi. So we can see that there is some antivirus running on the application or the, the server. The user did get an email that he should download that specific file. He executes a virus scan because that's important. Don't execute anything without virus scanning. And that was it. We have an up-to-date uh, Windows system and we just provided access to an attacker. PUP is also connected, so we can do basically anything. The user is using his password store normally, so he's trying to access it. He's trying to figure out his password to report this to IT, for example, but he doesn't know the original password, so he looks up in the password store. But we have a keylogger, so we know what's the password store's password. And we can execute it in our separated environment. And we have access to all the passwords. And that would be persistency. So the next time our application will be executed. 
in my later investigations, I figured it out that it's better to execute binary from network shares because in those cases, antivirus applications are almost ignoring them, all of them. <laughs> so don't use persistency by copying, rather try to execute it from a network share. And this was, a, I think this was a reboot. And everything is up and running again without proper access to the user's computer. Asset is up and running. It will be the same, but with a different antivirus. I really had not had the time to execute it with, with Windows Defender, but it's almost the same. And the best part is that you are protected because your antivirus tells you that you are protected. It, do it doesn't really detect anything strange like creating new desktops, downloading and executing binaries, loading the LS into other applications, migrating your binary into an explorer. So that's it. Thank you, these are the references. I think we will upload the PDF later, so. Okay, any questions? So far, Anybody so good. have anything? Yes. Oh, yep, So just a quick one. What if the AV vendor is disabling the execution of Rust? So Sorry. having a signature for Rust, any Rust compiled application, and they are disabling that. Sorry, again, I don't know. So what if an AV vendor is disabling the execution of Rust, all Rust applications? Because we are not really having a lot of in-house and third-party applications. Mm -hmm. They are just disabling that. Uh, I did not run into this issue. But uh, if you sign your application, for example, if you buy your signing certificate for 400 bucks, then everything is okay, I assume. So in this case, signing would be the key, I would say. Depends on how the AV is trusting the signature versus the compiler. In most cases, AV, uh, AVs are detecting signatures, like Yara rules or something. But the compiler, so you can strip. There is a strip co command in Rust compile. And the later, originally it was used by the nightly build, but right now you can use it in any Rust production code. And it will strip most of the strings. I am not sure why your AV is, is marking all the Rust code. I mean, they can go for any compiled code, not looking for strings, mm -hmm. but, but for like startup code or anything else. It depends, it depends on the AV. Let's talk later. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Andras. Thank you very much. Uh, it's now uh, break time. Uh, the next, uh, well, the afternoon session commences at 1.45. Thank you.